So thank you everyone for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong and we are talking about advanced features today. So advanced part modeling. Um, when I say advanced part modeling, really it's anything outside of what we don't cover in the Essentials webinar. So of course the Essentials webinar is pretty basic. The idea behind this one is we want to get into a little bit more detail in some of the part modeling features and on shape. So revolve sweeps, lofts, uh, derived features, shell, you know, some of the other commands that we don't cover in great detail in any other webinar. So advanced part modeling, um, as I always say with these these webinars, we really encourage you to ask any questions that you'd like. There's a questions dialogue and you go to webinar control panel, feel free to type anything in and I'll do my best from time to time to stop and make sure that I've answered all the questions. So again, you know, feel free to type in anything. So uh, let's get started. Now, as I always say with these webinars, there are a few things I like to point out to the users about Onshape in general before we get into the topic of the day. And the first is our mission statement. So if you're new to Onshape or you're just getting started with it, our goal with Onshape is getting everyone working together with CAD on any device, anywhere. And so if you haven't downloaded the Onshape mobile app for your iPad, iPhone, or Android phone or tablet, I definitely recommend it. It's not just a viewer. You have real CAD editing capabilities from your phone or tablet. Uh, so you can build models, you can build assemblies um, on a mobile device, and you can also work collaboratively. So another element of this is, you know, working together with CAD because it's a cloud-based system. Multiple people can edit the same model at the same time. So our goal is again, everyone working together with CAD on any device, anywhere. Now, a few other things I like to mention about Onshape in general. The first is we do consider ourselves professional 3D CAD. And when I say professional 3D CAD, generally people think of parts, assemblies, and of course, drawings. And we do have all three major pieces that make up a professional 3D CAD system. Some things that are unique, um, you'll find that Onshape has built-in version control. So with Onshape, you don't have to have a separate data management system or something to manage the files. Um, that concept goes away with Onshape. So with Onshape, we have version control built in and there is no concept of files to have to manage. Also, we can read and write a lot of common CAD formats that are out there. So if you have a library of CAD data, if you have a bunch of SolidWorks parts or, or IGIS or STEP or Parasolid or really any number of different formats, uh, we can read and write a lot of the common industry standards that are out there. So again, STEP, IGIS, Parasolid, SolidWorks, Inventor, CATIA, uh, Creo, there's a number of different formats that we can both import and export. Uh, the last thing to mention, I've already mentioned it briefly, but with Onshape we're introducing entirely new methods of collaboration. So in the past, you know, CAD has been a typically very isolating process, meaning one person can edit a file at a time. So one person building an assembly, one person modeling a part. Um, and that's because of the file-based nature of traditional CAD systems. With Onshape, we've gone with a different approach. We're using a database-driven CAD system that allows multiple people to work together. This means two or three people can assemble an assembly at the same time. Uh, two or three people can edit a part at the same time. So you can work together on the same model, or you can just work on different pieces of the model and see everything update live. You know, So you're not waiting for people to check in or save or any, any of those kinds of changes. So with Onshape, we've introduced entirely new methods of collaboration, including the ability to, to edit together in real time. Um, but it's more than just collaboration. You know, in terms of real time, there's also you know, tools like follow mode and our integrated comments and things that really change how collaboration works in CAD. So those are the things I like to highlight about Onshape in general. Now, let's get into the topic of the day. And that is, of course, advanced uh, topics. So... As I mentioned before, you know, this is really outside of the essentials level. So I'm assuming you've done some basic sketching and a few, you know, simple features and maybe you're ready to move on to some more complex shapes. Um, so in the essentials webinar, we cover, you know, basics of sketching and creating a simple extrude. In the advanced, I'd like to get into a little bit more detail. So sweeps, revolves, and of course, lofts. Um, so sweep, revolved, and loft, those are the four things that I want to get, or excuse me, three things that I want to make sure that I cover. Um, Whole feature as well. Another very important feature to creating uh, realistic models is the whole feature. And then, of course, we have shell, which is a very simple command, but I do want to show it. And then derived feature, a very useful one, especially if you're working with other data. If we have time at the end, I'd like to cover versions and compare. They go rather quickly. They're, they're a simple topic to cover, but they're very powerful. And I mentioned before, you know, you don't have to have a data management system with Onshape. Um, versions is a very easy way to manage those milestones and you can even compare them. So I'd like to show you an example of both. So 
Um, without further ado, let's jump in. Now, as I mentioned before, I'd like to start with uh, Sweep, Revolve, and of course, Loft. And actually, let's do that in a different order. Let's start with Revolve. So I'm going to jump into an Onshape tab here. And I want to start a sketch to create a Revolve feature. Now, if you haven't seen or, or used a Revolve feature yet, um, it's really for round parts. If you need a round part, Revolve features is probably one of the easiest ways to get there. And oftentimes it can simplify something that you might do using a series of extrudes. So Revolve feature, pretty straightforward. The key thing to keep in mind with the Revolve feature is we're drawing what amounts to like a slice section of the profile and rotating it and, and revolving it to create um, a round part. So that's the idea behind a revolve. Now the sketch at first isn't going to look much different. So let's go ahead and start a sketch. I'm going to left click the front plane, hit sketch, and right click view normal to sketch plane. So now we're ready to start sketching. And one of the first things I do with a revolve uh, sketch in general is define where my rotation axis is. And so if you think of this as rotating a part around, what is it rotating about? And this is just a, a matter of habit. It's not necessarily a requirement. Um, but if my rotation axis is different than you know where my sketch is located, I generally start there. And so in this case, I'm just going to use a simple line, make it construction geometry. Okay, so choose construction, and then I draw a line. Now in this case, I want a line horizontal right through the origin. Okay. So now that I have my line, I want to start sketching the real Revolve profile. Okay, and this is just going to be a series of lines, so bear with me for a moment. Um, real quick question, what's construction geometry? Construction geometry is uh, simply ignored. So we have, for instance, a solid line. This is a solid line. This is construction geometry. When I go to create a feature, like an extrude, revolve, sweep, or loft, the construction geometry is ignored. So it's there just for me to construct my sketch. The solid geometry is what's used for the feature. Okay, so again, construction geometry is just there for your reference. But it is ignored when you go to create a feature. So let's go back to a line, and I'll start sketching lines. If there's anyone else having any audio issues, let me know. Okay, so I've constructed a few lines. Now, a, a quick tip for those sketching. In, in this situation, you'll notice as I move my line down, what I'd like is a constraint relative to the point over here on the right. But as you'll notice, as I drag my line down, I'm not seeing that inference pop up. If you move your cursor over the point, and then move it back, you'll see the inference wake up. And that allows you to wake up any inference to any point. So if you're trying to get, create a constraint, you can just very easily move the cursor over it, and then it will automatically wake up that, uh, that inference. And I can do the same thing here. Notice no inference to that point, but if I move my, point, my cursor down over it, then it wakes up. All right, so I have sketched my... my closed contour. Now remember this is going to be a round part so you can picture like a pulley type part um, and what I'd like to do here is of course start to add a few dimensions and constraints. Um, so notice in this case if I drag any one of these entities around you see that it, the, the sketch is very underdefined. It's not centered over the origin. Here's the origin here and it's also not constrained in any type of any direction in terms of dimensions. So in general, the first things that I like to do is go in and add a few constraints. Now what I'd like is this geometry centered vertically over the origin. And this is another example where I can use construction geometry, so line construction, and draw a vertical line. Right. Now that I have a vertical line referencing the origin, I can add symmetry to my sketch. All right, and the way to do that, I'll left click uh, the point, for example, the construction line and the point. So left click all three, and then choose symmetric for the constraint type. 
And now if I drag those points, you'll notice they're symmetric about the construction line. All right, so that gives me the symmetry. I'll need to do this in a few places. So let's do symmetric, and then one last time here. Symmetric. And now, anywhere I drag, I get the symmetry you know, about the construction line. Now, this is a bit of a tangent uh, aside from Revolve, but I find it's a very common technique when you're sketching Revolve profiles. So now that we have some constraints in place that are really you know, attaching this to where I want it, I want to add a few dimensions. So I'm going to select the dimension tool. Now another tip, when you're defining dimensions, you, you can of course just select you know, line, line for example, and enter a value, very easy. But what we can also do, uh, in this case, is add diametric dimensions. So this is going to be a round part. Right? It's hard to picture that now, but remember we're rotating this sketch profile around to create a, a round part. And so what I want here is really a, a diameter value defining this sketch. But if I left click the line and then I left click my construction line that represents the middle, you'll notice by default it doesn't give me that. Right? That is essentially what would be a radius uh, value for a dimension. However, if I move my cursor past the construction line, it automatically doubles the value and adds a diameter symbol. Right? So I left click, enter my value. Okay. So it's very easy to go in and add diameter dimensions in the case of revolve profiles uh, without much work. Right? Just move your cursor past the line and you're good to go. So, a few last dimensions for width. And we have a fully defined sketch. Okay, so just to recap a few of the sketch tips, the symmetry, the symmetric constraint, you know, selecting point, construction line point, allows me to center that along the construction line. Right? Symmetry, symmetry is very useful. And then also the diametric dimensions, the ability to move past a construction line and double the value of your dimension, and of course add the diameter symbol. Um, so, a few questions. Noticed that your CSIS is showing Z positive. Can this be changed to have the Y positive and vertical? Uh, yes, it, I mean, it all would depend where I started my construction geometry and you know where I drew my lines, what orientation I drew my lines. Um, so I don't have to be overly concerned about that. Now, you could, I could have easily just drawn this as a vertical um, profile that rotated around a vertical axis. And, and in the end, I would have ended up with the same exact part, just in a different orientation. So there's not, there's not a big difference there. Uh, question, Mr. Basic, can we have default templates that contain company standards for model creation? Uh, referring to 3D model creation or drawing templates. Uh, if you're referring to drawing templates for two-dimensional drawings, um, you can absolutely import your own templates. In the, in the DWT format, you can import a template and use it as your drawing template. Um, in terms of part modeling templates, you can, of course, change the units and, and things like that, but um, there's not specifically anything else that you would... I, I don't see that you would want to change, so forgive me if I'm misunderstanding there. Um, okay, so I have a fully defined sketch. We are ready to revolve. Now, as I mentioned before, again, it's a little bit difficult to, to imagine, but this is, again, a slice section of what will be a round part. And so one of the first steps, I accept the sketch here, is select revolve. Okay. Select the face or sketch region that I want to revolve, in this case, the face here. Of course I can always select the sketch from the feature list as well and then define the revolve axis. Remember the revolve axis is what it's rotating about and if you remember the very first thing I did was draw a construction line right in the middle of what I want to define is what to rotate about. Okay. So I select that revolve axis and if we rotate things here you'll see it creates a revolve. Okay. So again, you know, now that, that we have the whole picture here, it's a little bit more uh, evident what we're doing. Right? We're taking a sketch and, and rotating it 360 degrees to create a round part. 
Uh, a few things that I want to point out. This is, of course, a full revolve, but you do have options to say, I only want to revolve, you know, 45 degrees, or I want to go, you know, 15 degrees one way and 10 degrees another. So you, you do have some controls here. You don't have to have just a full 360. You can um, specify how far you want to revolve. Okay, so that is the revolve command. Again, the idea there is you're drawing you know, what am amounts to like a sliced section of the part and then rotating it to create a round. So let's move on to the next example. And the next example I'd like to show you is an example of the sweep command. So let's create a new part for this. Let's we'll create a new blank part. And what I'd like to do is again start a sketch on the front plane. So front plane, sketch, and then I'll right click view normal to sketch plane. Now in the case of a sweep, uh, what's commonly done with a sweep is you have two critical pieces. You have a profile and a path. And in the case of a sweep, in the case of example I'm going to show you, uh, it's going to be comprised of two sketches, uh, two pieces, uh, two different um, entities, right? So again, you have your profile and the path. And the way to think of it is you're taking your profile, whatever the shape is, and you're sweeping it along the path. So what that means is most often you have to identify and either model it or, or select it, um, the path first. And in my case, I'm going to sketch the path first. So let's walk through a simple example of this. Now, I think a simple example of a sweep is a U-bolt, right? Everybody kind of understands what a U-bolt is. Um, so let's model up a U-bolt. Now, I'm already in a sketch on the front plane. Remember that I'm sketching the path for my sweep. So there's two steps to this. We're at step one, which is the path. I'll select line. I want to start at the origin, although that's not a rule. It's just, in my case, a best practice. And I'll draw a line vertically down. Left click to place. Then we'll select tangent arc and do a tangent arc from that line. And then one last line to finish. Okay. Now, a few things to keep in mind. You want to make sure that you have all the constraints in place. I did a tangent arc, which means this is tangent, right? But this line is not tangent to this arc. So just a tip, if you need to add a constraint, left click the entities, in this case the line in the arc, and then select the constraint type in this case, tangent. Okay. So now that line is tangent with the arc. So now that we have the constraints in place, I can add a few dimensions. Okay. So real simple, we'll do a couple of point-to-point -point dimensions. Let's do 1.5. Okay. And we'll do a height here of 1.5. Okay. So very simple. You know, shape. But again, remember that we're we're sketching what amounts to the path that our sweep will follow. So this is a think of it as the center line of that U bolt. Now, as I said before, there's really two steps to this, and this is only step one. So I'm going to accept this green check, and now I have my first sketch, sketch one. Right now, I can create the path. Or excuse me, the profile. Okay, so the profile is the shape that I want to sweep along this path. An important step though, is you want to make sure that your plane that you're sketching on is attached in some way to your path. So you may have noticed when I sketched this path that I made it coincident with the origin, which means that the top plane is right at the end of the path. Right, which means I can sketch on the top plane. But a tip, let's say that you didn't have that plane and you needed to create it. Right? You need to create your own plane. A tip, under plane, you have an option for curve point. And you can select curve point, select a line, and its end point, and a plane will automatically be added normal to the end of the line. Right, so that's a very common thing in the sweep command. Again, the key thing here is you want to make sure that your profile is attached to the path in some way. And one of the easiest ways to do it is uh, using a plane right at the end of the path. Okay. 
So just a tip, if you need to insert a plane, it will be curve point or most commonly, I should say, uh, curve point and you reference the line and the end point of the line and it'll automatically insert a plane normal to the end. Okay. But in my case, I have a default plane I can use and that's just because of the way I sketched it. Your example you know, may not be exactly the same and that's where you'll need to insert a plane. But because mine is, ends right on the top plane, I can use it. So I select top plane, sketch, again I'll right click, view normal to sketch plane, and now I can sketch my profile. Okay? Now in the case of a U-bolt, it's really just a simple circle, but this can be anything you'd like. Uh, I'm going to select circle, and I want to place this circle out here in space. Okay? We'll add a diameter dimension, uh, let's say 0.5, and now I have the basic shape. Actually, let's make that just a touch smaller, 375. So now what I'd like to do is attach this. And as I mentioned before, one of the key things is your profile, the circle, needs to be attached to the path. And one of the common ways to do this is with the pierce constraint. So just a tip, if I select the line in this case that, that, uh, that uh, is referenced in my first path sketch, and I select the end point, or this, excuse me, the center point of the circle, I can make those two pierce. And what that means is the where this line pierces my sketch plane, it will attach that point. Right? So it's a very easy way for me to attach the circle to the path. Right? But again, remember, you must constrain it in some way. Now, you could also use a coincident constraint. That works as well. It's the same thing. In this situation, it would be the same thing. Um, either works fine, but again, keep in mind, make sure to attach your profile to your path. Uh, once that's done, green check OK. Now I can sweep. I sweep. We'll select the circle as our profile. Then I can select the path. Now a tip. You can select individual pieces of the path, so you don't have to select everything in the sketch. But if you do want to select everything in the sketch, select it from the feature list. It's much easier um, than going through and defining it as um, individual pieces, especially if your path has dozens of lines and arcs and things. You won't want to select them individually. So selecting them from the feature list is very easy to do. And there we have our U-bolt. Okay. Now, just an aside, you know, the question often comes up, well, what if I wanted threads or what if I wanted things like chamfers? And of course, we have all those tools. So you have a chamfer here. I can easily select chamfer. Let's do an eighth inch chamfer, maybe too big. And then just select the corners, way too big. Okay. So you can select chamfer, select your edges. Same goes for fillet, by the way. Um, now, another tip is threads. Another another commonly asked question is how would I model a thread or how do we handle a helix for example. Um, so you'll see a helix tool right here on the toolbar and if you select the face it will apply a helix. Right? We can define pitch and I can say okay 1 divided by 12 12 pitch thread if this is an inch part and counterclockwise or clockwise very easy to do the key thing there, this is only creating the helix. And oftentimes this is, you know, good enough for a visual representation of a thread. You can, of course, actually cut a thread if you prefer. And you can go in and draw in your sketch triangle and sweep cut along the helix to create a thread. Right? So it's up to you if you want to go to that degree uh, of you know, control or that degree of detail. Um, but you can do that. Okay, it's just one more step on top of the helix. Um, so that is the sweep command. Again, the key things with the sweep, profile, and path. You're taking and you're sweeping the profile along the path. And that, that profile can be anything you'd like. I did a simple circle, could, but it could be a square, or just about any shape that you, you can sketch up. So um, again, that is the sweep command. 
Another example, or another question, excuse me. Um, your sweep profile is a flat 2D sketch. Can you show a quick example of sweeping using 3D geometry using a flexible hose, for example? We do not have a, what that would re require in this case, at least to do it very quickly, would be a 3D sketch tool. And that's something we hope to have very soon. We don't have it today. What I have seen other users do is create a combination of sketches. Uh, of course, it's a little bit more detailed. You'll do a lot more of inserting planes, like I mentioned before. Uh, but you can construct something like a, a flexible hose or a plumb line, a piece of plumbing or a wire even. Um, it's just a little bit more detail. It takes, takes, you know, inserting several planes and drawing several 2D sketches. Uh, what we hope to implement soon is, is a 3D sketching feature, which will allow you to do a lot more of those types of things quickly. Okay, so let's move on. Now that is revolve and sweep. Again, you know, the key things with revolve, you're rotating the sketch around to create a round part. The sweep is two steps, profile and path, and you're sweeping the profile along the path. So let's move on. Now, those two um, relatively simple features, you know, the, the sweep command has two steps. The revolve is, a, you know, not much more work than an extrude. The loft is an exception, and, and really, you, you resort to a loft when you, you can't use one of the other um, commands. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, lofts are, are very much a last resort. They're going to take more time. They're going to take more energy, but you get the exact contours you're looking for. Now, in many situations, uh, if, the, if you're trying to create a certain shape, you know, loft may be your only uh, tool, you know, if it's not something like a circle or, um, you know, some of the more straightforward shapes, you're going to need something like a loft. Uh, okay, so real quickly, jumping back to a couple of questions here, um, can we do something like mirroring um, the helix? And you can mirror entities. Uh, I do want to point that out. Let's choose top plane. Okay, now you have part feature or face mirror. So very important. And by the way, this also carries over to patterns and, and uh, circular patterns. But the first thing to define is, are you mirroring a part, a feature or a face? I can say, okay, let's mirror a feature. Let's choose the helix. And then I can choose the plane to mirror the helix about. Okay. Now, because my plane is here, it mirrors the helix over to here. So you would need to choose or insert a plane to mirror about, but yes, you can mirror a helix. Make sure it's set to feature mirror. Now you can also mirror a whole part or individual faces as well. Um, a good question. This is something I've seen with regards to what we discussed earlier. The 3D sketch example, example the 3D curve example, um, and, a, and a question that's popped up. Is there a way to project a sketch onto a surface? This would create a 3D curve to be used for sweeps. Um, there's not a direct project this onto this face command. However, what I have seen other users do is take two sketches and extrude using surfacing tools um, up to each other. And then that will create the 3D curve that you can then sweep around. So absolutely, there are ways to do this. And in fact, many of the tools that, that you know, are out there that exist are just you know, automating these methods. But you can use, for instance, two extruded surfaces as a reference um, for a loft. And, and one good example that I found that's a public document that's out there is the mouse. There's a, there's a mouse public model that has a great example of, of using two surfaces, joining them and, and lofting about that or sweeping around it or whatever you're trying to do. So yes, there are ways to do it, even though we may not have you know this specific button um, that you're looking for. Okay, so let's move on. Now, I, I wanted to get into loft, and loft is definitely one of the tools that you're going to spend a bit more time on. It's something that... Um, you know, is a lot more detailed, but if you're trying to control the surface very, um, with a very organic shape or something that's not perfectly, you know, cylindrical or, or square, for example, then you may need to resort to a loft. And the example I'd like to show with it, with this is, is the squeegee. So this actually has a few lofted pieces. So if I edit the loft here, you'll see this is a single loft between two profiles, but has a guide to drive the grips in the handle. Right, And the way to think of a loft is a gradual transition from one profile to another. This is a simple one, right? a circle to a smaller circle. 
right? So smaller circle on one end, larger circle on the other, it gradually tapers down. The advantage of the loft here is I can then introduce things like guides that allow me to manipulate the feature to create something that I wouldn't easily be able to do with a revolve, for example. Now, another example of this, and probably one of the more common examples, is transitioning between different types of contours. So, for example, a circle to a square or a rectangle. Right? I want to transition from a circle to a rectangle. Um, a very good example where you really couldn't accomplish it at least easily using any of this typical um, tools that we've covered up to this point. So this is an example where loft really does apply. Um, now, real quickly, a few tips about this command. Um, in general, again, you know, it's a last resort in terms of the tools that you, you know, if you could find another tool to accomplish it, you're probably better off. But once you've gotten into it, it will take a bit of time to set up. And one of the first tips that I can give you is when you're transitioning from something like a circle to something like a rectangle, there are a few things you can do to eliminate twist. And let me show you what I mean. So I select loft, very simple. And I select the profiles that I'd like to loft between. Now remember, you can loft between as many profiles as you want. So although I'm just going from one circle to one square, you can go from circle to square, back to circle, to you know any number of different profiles that you'd like. It is important that you select them in order. So don't jump around. You generally want to work from left to right or right to left and select them in order. So in this case, I want to loft from this circle to the sketch here, which is sketch 16. There we go. However, notice the twist, right? What I'm doing is I'm lofting from the face of the handle to the rectangle, but it doesn't know how to map the points of the rectangle corresponding to the points on the face. So what you end up with is a lot of twist in the loft. And the one thing I would say to this is don't be discouraged by this issue. It's very easy to fix. Um, it will take you know, oftentimes one more sketch or guides, uh, like the example I was showing you earlier. Um, but it's very easy to correct this. So this was, if you, if you remembered, I just selected this face. But a tip, let's go back here. Let me sketch five. Here I have a sketch that will drive the loft. So rather than selecting the face, I've created a circle and I've deliberately split the circle into four pieces. And if you haven't used the split command, you'll see it right here. Very easy to do. Just left click where you want to place the split points and it splits the entity up. Um, but what this accomplishes is now I have the same number of points in both profiles. So rectangle has four points, one, two, three, and four. And now when I loft, it will know to map corresponding to the location of uh, the points in the rectangle. So it allows me to do it much easier um, transition between contours exactly you know, how I would like to go from point to point uh, without having to do something as complex as guides. So now, Let's go ahead and turn on sketch five here. If I loft from sketch five uh, to sketch 16, notice much cleaner loft, right? Nowhere near as much twist, and that's because it's able to find the points on the sketch and map those points to the corresponding points on the rectangle. So just a tip, if you're doing lofts, um, in general, having the same number of vertices, the same number of points in all your profiles will create a lot cleaner loft profile without a lot of extra work, right? Um, just split the entity up and um, create your loft. So that's the first tip with regards to loft. You may need to um, split so that you have the same number of points. Now, what if I didn't want to do that? Or what if I wanted more control than this gives me? Notice that I have these guides out here. Um, and I want the loft to follow that very specifically, you know, and, and clearly this is a sharp transition. I have a few options that I want to point out with the loft. The first is in conditions. Okay. 
in conditions are very easy to apply. And so they're generally one of the first things I'll try if I'm just trying to tweak it a little bit. Right? I can say in conditions and then I can say, okay, normal to the profile. And you'll notice that as I did that, now the loft transitions normal to the profile for a longer period of time. So let me set this back to none. You'll see it's an immediate sharp transition. But if I set it to normal to profile, it maintains the normal direction for longer before it transitions into the rest of the loft. So you do have some controls here. You have controls like tangent to profile, which will, of course, you know, the opposite of normal will extend it tangent. But really nice is you have the ability to match tangent and match curvature, which will allow you, in this case, um, to match surrounding geometry. Okay? Um, so just keep that in mind. You have some options. Match tangent, match curvature will match the surrounding geometry uh, if you're using faces as references. Um, but again, in conditions are very easy to apply. And so if I was just looking for a small tweak to the way the default loft worked, in condition may be the solution. However, if that doesn't give you the level of control you're looking for, and this is, you know, I'm really trying to get the utmost detail out of my loft, then I would go to guides. Now, guides are a lot more uh, detail. You'll see here, and let me X out, I actually have uh, this one generated. You'll see that in this feature, I actually have four different guides selected. Okay, um, So, for example, um, I want to control you know, each corner independently and how it transitions from one end to another. I can use guides to accomplish it. Um, a couple of questions that have popped up. Is it possible to add more than one guide? For example, you have more, you have a guide from the circle. Can we add a guide to smoothen the loft towards the rectangle? Um, you can have as many guides in the loft as you'd like. Some key things to keep in mind, they must be attached to each profile. So in this case, each guide sketch is constrained to the profile sketches literally using a coincident or Pierce constraint, but you want to make sure that these guide sketches are attached to the profiles. If you have more than one profile, it needs to be attached to each profile. Um, so very important thing to keep in mind with guides, but you can have as many as you'd like. Uh, is it possible to use both in conditions and guides? Uh, no, unfortunately not. It's, it's one or the other. Um, again, you know, guides are when you want that real you know, tedious level of control where you're really trying to control fine details. Um, okay, so again, you know, the idea behind guides, you select guides and then you just select them in the loft command. And what you'll notice is the loft contours to follow those guides. Now, just another tip is what's neat about this, and this is just kind of an aside, but I can edit, let's edit this sketch. And this is one of the guide sketches here is in any sketch and this is not specific to lofts but it's just kind of a neat thing in lofts and we have this final button and if I click final it shows me the final end result and what's really neat is I can click final and then manipulate the spline and watch the loft update live right so I'm not forced to you know create a loft oh it doesn't look right edit the sketch move it hope that it rebuilds the way I expect it to and then, you know, hit OK, wait for it to rebuild, see, edit the sketch and do it over again. I can live move the splines and watch the loft update in real time. Okay, So just a tip, and this is not specific again to loft, but the final button while you're in a sketch will allow you to see the end result without having to accept the sketch. Right? It, it shows everything updating live. OK. What if I wanted to loft a 25-point star to a circle and then to a second 25-point star? Would I have to break the circle into 25 points and be able to loft that? It, it will probably loft fine, but what you may get is some twist in the loft that you don't care for. Um, and in that case, you, you can either do you know two guides or you can break the... the um, you know circle up into 25 different sections if, if that's what you're looking for, if that's the, you know, only solution. But the first thing I would say is, um, you know, try a guide or, or um, try it even without it, 
and and see if there's any twist. It, it all depends on the orientation of the of the part. So. Okay, would you show how the plane for Sketch 6 was created? Oh, good question. Okay, so with regards to guides, uh, and, and really just inserting planes in general, uh, let's roll back just real quickly here. So I have no loft, and you know I don't have the, let's say, plane uh, to, to create my guides, and I want to create it. How would I do that? And there are a few things, but in this example, um, you can use what we call a three-point plane. You can use three points to create a plane. So I can go plane, I can choose three-point, and then in this case, I just went point, point, point. Right? So two points from one sketch and, and a point from another, and it creates a plane right down the middle of those three points, which, of course, then I can go over here and sketch my spline on. Um, so just a tip, three-point plane would be useful in this. But in general, the plane command has a number of different options that can help you, especially when we're talking about things like guides. Okay, so that is the loft command. Um, again, you know, it's one of those tools that if you need it, um, you know, you'll know. It's the type of shape that you have to have it. So let's move on. Now, um, the next thing on my list was hole feature. So let's jump into the next tab here. And I have a real simple part. And what I'd like to do is show you how to create a simple hole feature. Now, I've, I've shown you two examples. Now, this is the most complicated example. And I mentioned before, it's absolutely possible. This is a swept cut of a helix following a you know, um, path. Okay, um, so you can create your own thread, threaded features, and that's if you want the ultimate realism, the ultimate detail. However, if you're looking for a simple solution for creating a quarter, you know, um, counterbore, a quarter inch counterbore, for example, and I don't care about necessarily the thread detail of cutting the threads into it, you can create a simple hole feature. Okay, and the neat thing about this is there's a database of sizes. So if I go to counterbore. I can choose my in condition, right? I can choose my standard. You can just enter values if you'd like, or you can go to ANSI standard, choose all the details of the standard that you want, right? Close fit, free fit. Um, it get, populates the details here. The neat thing about this is it's very easy to place holes. Basically, anywhere you have a sketch point, it will place a hole. So I'm going to select this point here from the sketch okay and it creates a hole now an important step make sure to define the merge scope what part is this feature merging with which is just the end cap here but now you'll notice i have a simple counterbore feature okay so again it's just a matter of selecting a point you know, anywhere you select a point, it creates a hole based on whatever you, you set it to. And you can select as many points as you'd like. Okay. I can even select points that aren't on the same sketch plane that belong to an entirely different sketch. Also notice that as I select this point, it doesn't start the counterbore where the point is. It recognizes where it intersects the part. So if you look, the depth is maintained. The minimum depth for the counterbore is maintained even on a, on a curved face slanted down in an angle. And that's because the feature recognizes where it intersects with the geometry. Okay, so you do not have to place the point exactly where it should be and then do manual steps to cut away geometry or anything along those lines if you have holes that are on angles or faces that, that need it. So just keep that in mind. You, do not, you don't have to have it exactly where it may be. It will recognize where the hole intersects the geometry. Okay? Um, how does the hole feature know in which direction to dig? And this is a very good question. It's the, the normal direction of the plane that it was sketched on. Okay, so the normal direction. So if I did a normal two here, that's the orientation. And it l recognizes the direction of the part uh, relative to that plane. Okay. All right. So that is the whole feature. Again, you have counterbore, countersink. You can create simple holes. One last thing I want to point out about this, and this is just for those doing any um, 
multi-part modeling. Remember in Onshape, you can model multiple parts together. You also have the blind in last option. So if you have a hole that you want to go through two parts or three parts, right, and you don't want the, to all line up, you can create a blind in last hole and then select the last part and it will create a hole through a series of parts if that's what you prefer. So just keep that in mind. This is for those out there um, doing multi-part modeling, building multiple parts in a single part studio. So that is the whole feature. Um, question, can you add G, D, and T to features? Can you add geometric dimensions and tolerancing to features? Um, you cannot add at the part level, the, the 3D model level. We don't, of course, we have the dimensions that are used to place it, and you can show those dimensions. You can right-click any sketch and say show the dimensions, but it's not um, what many would consider like a true model-based definition. Now, you can do G, D, and T. You can add geometric dimension and tolerancing to the 2D drawing of your, of your models. But in the 3D model, um, we're not adding that information, at least not yet. Okay, so just keep in mind, all the G, D, and T stuff in terms of on shape today is done in the 2D drawings. Okay, so that is the whole feature. Let's move on to the next one. The next example I have is the derived feature. And the, the reason I like to bring this up is oftentimes you have to model around something else. Right? I have a motor I got from someone else, or I have these CAD files that I've got from all these miscellaneous places, and I need to build my part around them, or I need to work with them in general. So how do we handle those types of situations? So this is what we call the derived feature. And the big thing I want to point out is it allows you to embed other parts from other tabs into your current tab. So I'd like to walk you through this now. Notice I have a blank Part Studio up, but I also have other tabs. So you'll see that I've imported two Parasolid files. And Onshape has translated them, so there is the bottom casing, and there is the top casing. Two separate parasolids. I need to bring them together and model a part around them, right? So how do I do that? That's using a derived feature, right? You, you insert a derived feature. You'll see it on the far right of the toolbar here and browse to the feature you'd like to import. Now, in this case, it's parts, but it could be planes, it could be helixes, it could be sketches. So you can insert derived sketches, for example, and use one derived sketch to drive everything in a whole other tab. So there's a whole different, a whole series of things you could do here. This is really a powerful capability. Uh, I just like to keep it simple at first, but we're going to insert a few parts, right? So I select the bottom case. Okay, it imports that part into this part studio. Right, so that's the derived part. We'll do that one more time. This time, the top case. Okay. We'll import the top case, and of course, it inserts that into the part studio. So now I've inserted two parts into my part studio, and you can insert as many as you'd like. But again, you know, imagine that these were castings that you got some from a vendor, and you need to model a flange. Right, you'd want to bring them together. That's where derived feature comes into play. And now I can start creating features. Right? So it's very easy for me to use the faces of the part as references and start creating my geometry. Okay, so just keep this in mind. Um, it's a tool, valuable tool for creating um, references to external parts or even just other features, other sketches and things like that. Um, I can even convert the circular edges of the imported model to sketch geometry. And I can use the convert command and convert it and then do a simple extrude. You forgive me for how quickly I'm doing it, but I built a simple flange, right? So now I have built, you know, my part relative to the two parts that I imported from somewhere else. Okay. A uh, question, difference between casing and case. Um, forgive me, I, maybe maybe that was just something I said and, and misspoke. These parts are called casing, um, and I'm inserting them into this part studio. So may, maybe that was just something I misspoke, forgive me. 
Okay, another very good question. How did it know to place it perfectly on top? And this is a very good question. That's because these parts were modeled that way. They were modeled with respect to their origin in that orientation. However, if yours weren't, you'll need to use something like a transform. Where I do transform and I select a part to transform and I can say, okay, transform by XYZ and move up if I wanted to. And it would do a transform and, and shift the part around. What I would recommend if you're doing a lot of this is, and this is a bit of an advanced, I'm not going to get into too great a detail, um, but is a transform by mate connectors where I attach a mate connector on one part, a mate connector on another, and it makes positioning them very easy. Just transform a make connector, select the two make connectors, and they come together in the, the orientation you would expect. Um, but just a tip, and this is a, another, you know, I, I see another question on it. Why do the parts land so conveniently? And that's because of the way they were modeled. If yours don't import that cleanly, you'll need to transform. And, and if you're doing a lot of this and then none of them are importing the way you'd expect, I would use a transform by make connector. Okay. So if you haven't done the research on make connectors yet, they're right here. They're critical to assemblies, but also very valuable in parts. And you can think of them as a, a little coordinate system. So I'd be placing one coordinate system on one part, one coordinate system on another part, and then I bring them together and it automatically knows orientation and all those things because it's, you know, it has an X, Y, and Z. So um, make connectors, transform with make connectors. There's other content out there. There's other videos that I'd recommend um, but if you're doing a lot of importing derived parts that don't have clean origins or coming in in all these weird orientations, that's a valuable tool for moving things around. Okay. Um, okay. In order to produce a part relative to the features of another part, do I always use a derived part? It's not a requirement. And, and the example I gave here, I'm actually bringing two different files together. But for instance, if I just needed to build a simple flange for this piece, I do not need to insert a drive feature. I can go right on sketching on this face. So it, it, it depends on the scenario. I needed to bring two parts together, and so I needed a derived feature. Um, but if you're just inserting one part and maybe building some piece around that one part, that may not be necessary. Okay, so... I have a few minutes left. Uh, that's good. I wanted to take a moment. Oh, there's one last thing I didn't mention here. Um, derived features. So we've inserted these two parts as derived features. I built this flange around them. Now, the key thing with derived features is they will update if the originals change. So if I go back to the tabs that make up those two parts and I modify them, the other tab will update. Right, so let's do a simple, I'm just going to do a simple move face. We'll do an offset of three quarter inch. And I'm just making a simple change to the model. I'm going to make that outlet a smaller diameter. Right, so green check, much smaller diameter. Let's do the same thing on the top casing. Do move face, offset, three quarter inch. Okay, and again, I'm just making a change to the original parts. But the key thing here is now when I go back to my part where they're derived, they update, right? Which means my flange will update. So if you notice, now my flange has a much smaller hole, okay? So the key thing with the derived feature is it allows you to have one, you know, master tab that has all the changes and then any other tabs where that's derived automatically update to those changes. Okay. All right, so that is my last bit on a derived feature. Uh, another very good question. Uh, whenever I have to build one part around another, it always becomes part of the same part. How do I keep them separate? And there's a very good question. As I'm building a feature, so let's say um, I, you know, I'm just going to make up a scenario here. I need to build some kind of simple gasket for this piece and I select the face and I do an, a, you know, a convert or maybe I just select a piece of it and convert um, and I'm ready to create my new part right so let's close this contour up um, close this up 
So I can extrude it. Bear with me for just a second. So this is the issue. I've created this feature and I've created this sketch and I'm ready to extrude and it looks like there it was it defaults to merging with the part. The key difference is instead of add, which is the default, if it's attached to another face and, and it can add, it will, you choose new. Okay. This creates a second part in your part studio. So you'll see now I have part two in the part studio. So that's the key thing. It doesn't matter if it's extrude, revolve, sweeps, or loft. You have this new option that creates a new part in your part studio. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Compare. This is the one last thing. I have just a couple minutes left, so bear with me. This is one of those that I think is very underused and really powerful capability. Um, so the big thing is, as I mentioned earlier on, you do not have to have a separate data management software with Onshape. We have version control built in. Now, the easiest way to create a version is this icon here. And the way to think of a version is it captures a snapshot of the entire document. All parts, assemblies, drawings, anything attached to the document gets versioned. And so you can always go back and look at it. And there's a very quick button here. You click Create Version and it creates one. However, once you've created your version, you can go to the version manager here, and you'll see you'll you'll see them listed. What's really neat is you can see every single change that's ever happened to your model. So if you haven't taken a look at history yet, I definitely recommend it. But if you select show changes, I can see every little change that's happened to this model since I created it. So I've got main, which is the current status of the model. But if I left click revision A, this is a version created in August of last year. Left click, and it loads revision A. Right? So you'll notice revision A is quite a bit different. There's no large boss here. The part is overall smaller. These cuts are a bit different. So there's some differences between revision A and the way my model currently sits. And I'm seeing this through versions. So I created this version in August. Now I'm going back and looking at that version today. Right? I can go back and download the model if I wanted to. Um, but the neat thing about this is it captures that snapshot of that milestone of my design so that I can always go back and look at it. Now, let's say, for example, you know, I have um, revision A was created in August. I have this model that was last modified in January. How do I know what's different? between the two of them, right? How can I see the difference between the two of them? And this is when we get into the compare. So again, just to recap, create version, very simple. You can click create version, give it a name, hit create. That's really all there is to it. Um, and it creates a snapshot of the model. But once you've created that version, you can compare two versions, uh, two branches, even two moments in history. So I want to compare main, which is the model the way it is today, to revision A. Under the gear drop down, you'll see the option to compare. I choose compare and it compares main to revision A. So now I'm comparing two versions. The neat thing about this is it gives you two things. It gives you a graphical view of the difference and it gives you a list feature by feature of the differences. So I can see that in main, sketch one is different. Extrude one is different. Right, if I left click, it actually tells me the exact difference. Extrude one, the difference here is 20 millimeters depth in main, 22 millimeters depth in revision A. Right? So I get a very specific breakdown. If I select the fillet, it tells me that in main it only has four edges and the radius is four millimeters. But in revision A, it was six edges, five millimeter radius. So you get a very specific breakdown of what the differences are between versions or between you know, even moments in history. I can go back to a moment in history six months ago and say, compare this. So it gives you a breakdown of what's different. It gives you a breakdown of what exists in one and not the other. So here, fillet seven exists in revision A, but doesn't exist in main. Plain exists, plain is different. Chamfer one exists in main, but doesn't exist in revision A. 
right? So you can very specifically see the breakdown. So that's the list. And again, if you're looking for specifics, that's the way to get to it. But if you're looking for like a high level, you know, graphical difference between the two, that's where the slider comes in. So you just grab this slider and drag it left to right, and it will graphically show you the difference between the two versions. Okay. And it just turns one transparent over the other. But the neat thing about that is you can really quickly at a glance grab it left to right and see, okay, that's the big difference between the two parts. This is one of those tools that's very underused and really, really powerful capability um, that I can't recommend enough. And, and you don't have to create versions. You can go back and do it to a moment in history. So just keep this one in mind. Now, another big tip is leaving the compare. and You want to choose where you want to go back to. I'm going to go back to main. So I left click main and it takes me back to the model so I can go on and continue editing. Okay, so just a tip, you want to get out of compare by clicking on uh, the version that you want to go into. Okay. All right, so a few couple a couple questions left. Um, I am out of time. Uh, I will stick around and answer the questions. So bear with me for just one second. Um, but for those going forward, if you're just getting started in Onshape, we really encourage you to try it in your professional environment and let us know what you think. There's a feedback tool built into the help, uh, help in the top right corner. We make it very easy for you to give us feedback. We really encourage you to give us any feedback that you have. Um, also, invite others and share. If you haven't shared your document yet, it's very easy. It's very much like Google Docs. There's a big share button in the top right. You click share. You enter their email address, define their permissions, and you hit share and that they can be working live in real time with you. So you can share your models by default. Everything you create is private to you, um, but you have that option. You can share your models and work together in real time. Also, if you've been using, using Onshape a while and maybe you're interested in establishing a local user group or maybe meeting local users, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help you set up and, and get things going. So that is what I have. I'm going to stick around and answer any questions, so forgive me. I know there's a few outstanding ones there. Um, but that's it, everyone. Thank you and have a good day. A uh, question. When I'm creating or editing features, all the geometry in the viewer disappears. I'm using Google Chrome. Have you seen this as a way to keep the geometry visible? Editing features, all the geometry in the viewer disappears. Um, forgive me if I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding it. Uh, do, if... Um, this may be an issue specific to the hardware. It may be just um, just not understanding. If if you're in a sketch, um, you will not see, at least by default, the geometry. So if you're editing a sketch, you won't see the geometry associated with that feature. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, so forgive me. Um, if that's not the case, then there might be some other hardware issue or something that I'm not seeing here. And what I would do there... Um, I'm showing my screen, so bear with me for just a second. 